Hello, and welcome to Conversations from the World of Allergy, a podcast produced by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm your host, Dave Stukas. I'm a board-certified allergist and immunologist and serve as the social media medical editor for the Academy. Our podcast series will use different formats to interview thought leaders in the world of allergy and immunology. This podcast is not intended to provide any individual medical advice to our listeners. We do hope that our conversations provide evidence-based information. Any questions pertaining to one's own health should always be discussed with their personal physician. The Find an Allergist search engine on the Academy website is a useful tool to locate a listing of board-certified allergists in your area. Finally, use of this audio program is subject to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at www.aaai.org. Today's edition of our Conversations from the World of Allergy podcast series will discuss the new anaphylaxis practice parameters, and I'm hopeful that our conversation will be useful not only for healthcare professionals, but for the general public as well, especially our patients that are at risk of having anaphylaxis. We are very pleased to welcome Dr. David Golden back to the show. Dr. Golden is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University and Division Chief for Allergy Immunology at Sinai and Franklin Square Hospitals in Baltimore. Dr. Golden has been on the podcast previously to discuss the Joint Task Force on Practice Parameters and another episode focused on venom hypersensitivity. As you're about to learn, he is a true expert and excellent communicator. Dr. Golden, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and welcome back to the show. Oh, great to be back. Thanks so much for inviting me. No, this is, this is wonderful, and, and we have a lot to get through in this conversation, and we're going to link the full practice parameters uh, to the episode on our website uh, so everybody can read it for themselves, as I'm sure this is going to generate a lot of additional interest. But I guess to help set the stage, can you just begin by describing the process involved in putting this massive document uh, together? The, the process begins with the Joint Task Force on Practice Parameters. Um, choosing a topic uh when we have uh when we complete one uh practice parameter we uh prepare to get busy on another and we look at what topics uh need to be updated because they were last done many years ago we look at topics that uh have uh new and new evidence and uh, new um new research that will potentially impact clinical practice. So we want to create guidelines that are uh, important to practitioners and that contain new and updated information that will help uh, patients and clinicians to take care of allergic diseases. So uh, we recognize that anaphylaxis needed to be uh, updated, although uh, we'll come back in a moment to talking about uh, how this fits into the uh, series of guidelines that are developed on anaphylaxis and uh, and other topics. Um, so then we have to get, uh, we, we propose topics to the uh, American College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology and American Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology who are our parent organizations. Uh, and they together um, decide which topics uh, they agree are uh, needing to be developed and covered and give us the approval to go ahead, which they did. Uh, and then we get busy choosing uh, a, uh, as the task force, uh, choosing a um, co-chairs for that practice parameter uh, work group, and then the members of that work group, uh, who then get to work on uh, thinking through, uh, along with the guidance of the task force when they develop the topic, uh, what kinds of areas are most in need of updating so that they can get uh, start with a search of the literature to identify all of the research that has uh, happened over the past five to 10 years, depending on when the last guideline was done and distilling that uh, and analyzing that into um, evidence-based recommendations for practitioners. And, and then it goes through uh, a series of, after the task force practice, uh, excuse me, after the work group has uh, gone through several stages of uh, and drafts of doing this uh, monster document. Uh, it goes for review by the entire task force, and then comes back to the work group for revision, and then goes back to the entire uh, academy and college membership, as well as appointed reviewers who give us a lot of constructive uh, ideas to further improve the document. And then finally, it goes to the journal for publication. Uh, okay. <laughs> so it's more than one conference call. Is what it's a process. <laughs> uh, this was published online in December of 2023, and it is the 2023 practice parameter. Uh, what year did you begin working on this? 
it was um, approved, I believe, in 2018. Wow. But, and it took the better part of a year to um, really focus in on the topics that would be most productively covered to develop new recommendations and to get a work group up and running. Uh, it then took, as do most of the practice parameters and guidelines that the task force produces, uh, it then takes a couple of years to uh, actually uh, accumulate, analyze, uh, and analyze all that uh, research and evidence and create the uh, discussion and recommendations that you see in the final document. And then it can take six plus months, as it did with this document, to go through that long review process and revision that I described. My goodness. And and you had mentioned that um, when you decide what topics to address it, you want to sort of complement prior parameters, update those that need to be updated. But you actually started developing this in conjunction when the 2020 anaphylaxis practice parameters are already in the works. So how does this parameter actually differ from those? Uh, that, that's true. This was uh, this is actually an example, uh, which we've done before, of uh, using the, the two different types of practice parameters that the task force develops to complement each other. So we do uh, grade guidelines, um, which is a whole other topic, which uh, we've talked about, uh, about what grade guidelines are and how they are developed and, and why are they so important. Um, the, the, I'll go back for a moment to say that the, uh, the last full practice parameter on anaphylaxis, uh, last update was in 2015. Uh, chaired by Dr. Phil Lieberman. Uh, the 2020 uh, update was a grade practice parameter and grade guidelines are often focused on very specific questions. And in that case, there were actually only two major questions that were addressed, which uh, we'll come back to talking about because they have been updated as well. In the case of grade guidelines, uh, it, it's important to uh, cover topics uh, for which the, there's more, the most meaningful uh, evidence and highest quality evidence. But there are often many areas that are left uncovered. And in the case of anaphylaxis, we identified a number of areas of uh, interest and importance to clinicians and patients uh, that were not covered in the grade guideline and for which there uh, is uh, a lot of published research and evidence, but not necessarily the kind of controlled trials and high level evidence that would have been most meaningfully addressed in a grade guideline. But there's still all these uh, um, important areas of research that can help us to give updated guidelines to clinicians on evaluation and management of anaphylaxis. And that's what goes into choosing the topics for this 2023 update in anaphylaxis, which is a so-called traditional practice parameter. And in the traditional practice parameters, um, we can uh, cover sometimes the uh, broadest uh, full coverage of a topic, or in the case of this 2023 anaphylaxis update, seven selected topics that uh, make it a much broader document, uh, but still it still doesn't completely um, uh, replace the 2015 practice parameter, for example. There are areas that we didn't cover because we didn't feel that there were meaningful updates, and clinicians yeah. who uh, are looking for um, information and uh, guidance in other areas may still look back to the 2015 uh, guideline, for example. So uh, that's the uh, position of this 2023 update. And I started by saying that uh, this is an approach that we often take, as we did with rhinitis, where we did a grade guideline in 2017 on selected topics, and then in 2020 published a full update of the entire rhinitis uh, practice parameter, which was a traditional practice parameter. This is an approach we may take in the future when uh, when warranted to help cover the uh, most, uh, the, the broadest number of topics that clinicians need to be updated on. I, I really appreciate your explanation of all that. And I think it's important for our listeners to understand, as you mentioned, uh, you know, there's no, you can't cover everything, right? It's almost impossible. Um, so this complements mm -hmm. the 2015, uh, this complements the 2020 anaphylaxis practice parameters. So, you know, no practice parameter kind of lives in isolation by itself is, is kind of how I interpret it. And, you know, you and I have read this 
current um, practice parameter through in its entirety multiple times. It's 53 pages. Uh, it has 48 separate consensus-based statements and recommendations, and there are 489 references. So in your opinion, what's the best way for clinicians to utilize this resource? Should they just sit down and, and read it through start to finish? Uh, should they look through certain sections, reference it when questions arise? What advice do you have for those listening right now? Great question. Uh, and, and I think all the above, actually, uh, because it depends when you sit down with this document, what it, why did you pull it out in the first place? Uh, if you have the time and inclination, you really should read it from start to finish uh, to know what's in there to help you in the future when you do want to look back at it uh, and to absorb all of the uh, research and, and advances that have occurred over the past five or 10 years in anaphylaxis. Uh, but it, it, in, in real life and in real practice, uh, what we're doing most of the time is we have a patient uh, or specific question that we want to see what the uh, best updated guidance is or how to evaluate this patient, how to treat this patient. So we're going to look back as a practitioner. I'm going to look back at a, at a, at a practice parameter uh, when I want to look into at a certain section and even a certain question. Uh, so I'm referencing it when questions arise. There are times when I just want to look through a particular section. Uh, because I want to be updated on uh, the latest guidelines on uh, diagnosis of anaphylaxis, for example. So uh, all of the things you mentioned are, are totally appropriate depending on uh, what your needs as a clinician are at the time and uh, what you really want to learn. Uh, if I may, I think this makes for a fantastic journal club as well, whether you're in an mm. academic center or even within a practice. Just sit down and have a conversation and kind of people can tease out different sections to present. But that's my two cents, at least. Now, we'll go through many of these individually, but um, can you just describe what a consensus based statement entails and how they should be interpreted? Yeah, that's really important, actually. Uh, people will wonder, what is this consensus based statement? Uh, although this is uh, a concept that we've been using uh, for quite a, for a few years now, uh, as we uh, have distinguished our grade guidelines from our practice parameters. Uh, so, in the grade guidelines, there are recommendations, uh, and those re and their recommendations um, be based on, as I was saying, an extensive analysis of the uh, entirety of the literature. Basically, there's a systematic review and meta-analysis that forms the basis for uh, every one of those uh, grade recommendations. And, and even grade recommendations can be strong or conditional. Mm -hmm. And uh, strong recommendations are usually based on controlled clinical trials uh, or very, uh, other very high level, high certainty evidence. So it, it, we're looking. We, what we want to do is to create the most trustworthy guidelines, and the most trustworthy recommendations are those that are based on the the best of all evidence. But there's a lot of research and a lot of evidence that is that is good evidence, but it may not be the best. It may have some deficiencies that we have to take into account, and uh, and that always makes the recommendations a little less certain. Uh, so those are called conditional recommendations, and that's a signal that should be a signal to clinicians that there is room for um, individual uh, personalized medicine and, and shared decision making. We'll, we'll probably come back to that concept uh, in interpreting those uh, consent, those recommendations um, for the individual and taking into account that the evidence that it's based on was not uh, as certain and, and therefore uh, the way to apply that recommendation is also a little less certain. So I'm saying that because now we can turn to consensus-based statements. Uh, consensus-based statements uh, represent recommendations that are not based on a systematic review and meta-analysis, are not based on necessarily on the highest quality evidence, uh, and therefore, we wanted to, to draw back a little bit from even calling them recommendations. Now, they are recommendations, but we wanted to emphasize that they're actually, they do involve a, an expert consensus. And they are consensus-based statements because they're not based on grade quality evidence. That, that's a concept that um, distinguishes them. We didn't want to have the appearance that we were creating grade quality recommendations. So we want to call them consensus-based statements. They are still either strong or conditional, uh, 
for the same reasons that I said earlier and the conditional recommendations. And because they're consensus-based statements, almost all of them are um, conditional and should be interpreted and applied that way uh, with lots of discussion about the pros and cons and the strengths and weaknesses of the, of the evidence as they apply to this particular case or this particular patient. And that's called shared decision-making when you involve the patient and their values and preferences, uh, which play an important role in uh, applying a recommendation to an individual patient at any time. Uh, as we'll do, I mean, this applies to our entire conversation, but for our listeners, please um, check out the entire document for yourself. There's a great description of everything Dr. Golden just sort of summarized there. Uh, it, it it takes a while to get used to it, to be honest with you, at least it for me. And you kind of have to read through it and understand it and, and think through, okay, this is when it may apply. This is when it may not apply. So that's great. Well, let's, let's get into the meat of the document and go through the different sections. The first section focuses on uh, updates to the diagnosis of anaphylaxis. Uh, here's the million dollar question. How is anaphylaxis best diagnosed? Uh, it sounds obvious, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> anaphylaxis should be easy to diagnose. Uh, and sometimes it is, but it is really, uh, and this is why we brought this uh, up front and center uh, as the first section of the document, because uh, it's just not always as clear as it sounds. So the, the diagnosis of anaphylaxis, as you might expect, should be based on uh, the history, uh, a physical examination, of course, on the criteria uh, for the diagnosis of anaphylaxis, which we'll talk a bit about. And, and uh, making that diagnosis can involve knowing the risk factors that are uh, relevant to this patient at this time, uh, uh, often involve um, clinical judgment, actually. Uh, and, uh, and we'll talk afterwards about the role of trip days in making or confirming that diagnosis. So, you know, I, I mentioned criteria for the diagnosis of anaphylaxis, and uh, I, we recognize the criteria are often retrospective. When you look back at a, a case, uh, you can look at all of the documented uh, descriptions and try to decide whether this was anaphylaxis. But in the moment, when the patient is having a reaction, are you trying to make a diagnosis and decide if this is anaphylaxis? Well, yes and no. Uh, this is one point where I want to emphasize that the criteria for giving epinephrine are not the same as the criteria for diagnosis of anaphylaxis. Uh, and, and this is emphasized in, and in fact, there are separate recommendations in, the, uh, in, in this practice parameter update to emphasize that uh, giving epinephrine and diagnosing anaphylaxis are not dependent on each other. You don't have to diagnose epinephrine to give, uh, excuse me, anaphylaxis to give epinephrine. And just because you give epinephrine doesn't mean that it was necessarily anaphylaxis. Uh, so I wanted to separate those two concepts. So uh, in the criteria for the diagnosis of anaphylaxis, we have for many years, uh, since 2006 to be exact, been using the NIAID FAIR, uh, so-called Samson uh, criteria for diagnosis of anaphylaxis. Uh, there, uh, in this update, we mentioned that the World Allergy Organization, the WAO, uh, published in 2020 an, uh, an update to try to simplify uh, these criteria for diagnosis of anaphylaxis. Um, and th they're close, but it, it does broaden the, ability, the way to apply the criteria. And uh, I won't go into a lot of detail for now. Uh, for those who want to know more about the differences, there's a uh, a chart, a table in the document that will help to uh, understand the differences and similarities uh, and strengths and weaknesses potentially uh, of these two uh, similar but different uh, sets of criteria for diagnosis of anaphylaxis. Uh, the, the original NIH criteria have been validated in many research studies over the years since 2006. These 2020 updated uh, criteria from the WAO remain to be validated, so time will tell how they stand up, uh, but they, the simplification definitely has some apparent advantages, but in looking at them carefully, neither of them is perfect. There's also a table in the guideline that gives examples of cases where the diagnosis of anaphylaxis may actually differ between the two guidelines. So mm -hmm. looking that over will help the reader to uh, understand the application of these criteria and how they may differ and give you a better feel of um, how to make that or confirm that diagnosis of anaphylaxis. Uh, 
What can you tell us about a serum tryptase level and when should this be utilized in the evaluation or diagnosis of anaphylaxis? Mm. Uh, always <laughs> is one way of answering that question. And that's, a, that's an important update. Uh, the tryptase has been uh, used mainly, uh, well, in two ways. Uh, to uh, confirm the diagnosis of anaphylaxis, which I'll come right back to, uh, and to look for underlying conditions, which we will also talk about, that uh, predispose people to having more frequent or more severe anaphylaxis. So that's really important. Uh, but in in anaphylaxis with mast cell and basophil mediator release, like histamine and other uh, factors, uh, one would expect that tryptase would uh, would of course be released and would be measured. It's it's easier to measure tryptase than to measure histamine. So tryptase has become the marker for anaphylaxis. Uh, and in the past, it was it was said, well, uh, if you're not sure of the diagnosis, then draw a tryptase level. Um, but that uncertainty often comes up after the dust has settled, so to speak. And then it's too late to get that tryptase level. Uh, to identify an elevation in tryptase, you really have to get that blood sample within the first hour or two after the onset of symptoms because uh, the tryptase goes up uh, rapidly. So within 15 to 30 minutes, you can get a peak tryptase level, but it comes down gradually over a period of an hour or two or more, depending how high it goes. So to really capture it, you have to capture it early. So the recommendation now is to measure tryptase uh, pretty much acutely. Uh, first, treat the uh, reaction, stabilize the patient, of course, and then draw blood and uh, be sure to send a sample for tryptase measurement because it may turn out to be very important in uh, making that diagnosis and confirming that diagnosis. But to know whether it went up is also tricky. And there's a lot of discussion uh, in the uh, practice parameter update about uh, how to define an elevation of the tryptase. Does it need to be above the so-called normal limit of 11.4 nanograms per mil, or does it need to just go up a certain amount and how much? Uh, those are all details that are described in detail in the document, and they're very good uh, and very accurate ways now of getting that tryptase level to tell you whether this was or wasn't anaphylaxis. And, and believe me, from having uh, analyzed many cases of uncertain anaphylaxis, that that tryptase can make all the difference in the world. Mm. And does a normal tryptase rule out anaphylaxis? A normal tryptase does not rule out anaphylaxis. Uh, but as we've become better at identifying, uh, as I was saying, the, the ways of knowing whether it went up, uh, we're finding more and more that, um, that it'd be very unusual for it not to go up. For example, it was long said that tryptase doesn't often go up in cases of food anaphylaxis. Turns out that that's probably not true. It's just that it, it goes up, if it goes up from a level of 3.5 to a level of uh, 7, that's a very significant increase. But 7 is still a very normal level. Uh, it, it's reported as a normal level is maybe what I should say. Uh, so that can be missed. And, and that's why in the, in the literature, it, it was said that the tryptase does not become elevated in food anaphylaxis. But it does go up compared to the baseline level. So again, I'm going to emphasize the, the importance of getting that baseline level. It can be days or weeks uh, or months, if necessary, after the event. As long as you have the acute level, you can get a baseline level for that patient at any time after that. And then you have something to compare and then you can see whether it actually went up. So I, I'm still going to go back to your question and say that, that a, a normal tryptase level definitely does not rule out anaphylaxis. A lack of increase doesn't rule it out, but it makes it much more questionable. Mm -hmm. um, a great perspective, uh, and there's a lot more in the document, of course. You had mentioned that there are some conditions that we're learning about that would predispose individuals to either having uh, more severe anaphylaxis or perhaps recurrent anaphylaxis. I'd like for you to, to talk about one called hereditary alpha tryptosemia, because uh, this is relatively new uh, as far as understanding the diagnosis. Why is it important for clinicians to be aware of this condition when they're evaluating somebody with suspected anaphylaxis, particularly recurrent anaphylaxis. Now that's, that brings us back to that baseline measurement and mm -hmm. another reason that it's important because if the tryptase is, uh, let's say, 20 uh, during the reaction, but then you do a baseline level and it's still 20, does that mean it wasn't anaphylaxis? Mm 
Well, actually, that's a possibility. But what you're really seeing is that this patient has an underlying mast cell condition uh, that is causing them to constantly be releasing tryptase, if you will. So obviously, their mast cells are at a heightened level of activation and are more reactive, if you will. So hereditary alpha tryptosemia is a mast cell condition, a genetic condition, and it is hereditary, in which uh, the person has too many genes or an, uh, an extra gene or two or three of the alpha tryptase gene. So having extra alpha tryptase genes means you make extra alpha tryptase. And uh, one would think that that could be harmless, but it, it turns out to be a significant risk factor for severe anaphylaxis. Uh, so, for, so that's one important point, just the fact that having uh, ele elevated alpha tryptase, uh, let me rephrase that, having hereditary alpha tryptosemia and any baseline tryptase greater than eight, uh, which is still incidentally within this so-called normal range, but if it's greater than eight nanograms per mil, it, it, it may be associated with an underlying hereditary alpha tryptosemia, and people who have this HAT, hereditary alpha tryptosemia, um, are known to have more, uh, not necessarily more chance of having anaphylaxis, mm -hmm. but if they have anaphylaxis, more chance that it's going to be severe. Mm -hmm. That's an important distinction. Well, okay, that was section one. <laughs> So the, the next major section focuses on uh, a really interesting area, at least to me, uh, anaphylaxis in infants and toddlers. And in my experience, this is an area that is just filled with such outdated and incorrect assumptions and misconceptions. Uh, my goodness, we've just we've scared the hell out of parents everywhere uh, about feeding their babies. So uh, help us out. Uh, are infants at higher risk for anaphylaxis in general compared to older children, adolescents, and adults, uh, and, and in particular, severe anaphylaxis? No and no. Um, and, you know, th we, we did this section not because th there's a ton of new uh, and, and uh, I was going to say meaningful evidence. Uh, the, the, the thing is, there's, we're, what's important is that we're, we've recognized uh, since the last full guideline in, in 2015, we've recognized the importance, uh, the, the, the fact that anaphylaxis can differ in some very important ways in infants and toddlers and that we, we need clinicians to be more aware of that. So your question is one of those things. Uh, actually, the proportion of anaphylaxis cases that are severe is half as much in young in infants and toddlers as it is, let's say, at age 50 or 60. Severe anaphylaxis is far more common in adults and older adults than in children. And even in the youngest children, it's less likely to be severe than it is in the older children. That's really interesting and, and another important point. And this goes back to, again, so many parents are led to believe that their baby's initial allergic reaction to a food. So the first time they feed their baby, they're driving to the parking lot of emergency rooms. Uh, they're led to believe it's going to be severe because of their inability to communicate or because they have really small, tiny airways. Is this true? Well, those concerns have some validity. But the important thing here is that, and this is where we did uh, look at a systematic review uh, uh, and meta-analysis um, to, to know that the first reaction, so this is important now with early introduction of foods, which is recommended, um, that the first reaction to initial or early introduction of a food is very unlikely to be severe. Can you repeat that one more time for our listeners so they can, I, well, I, let, I can let's, the how, about, how about a dramatic pause so everybody pay attention, put your laundry away for a second. Okay, Dr. Golden, say that one more time, please. <laughs> the first reaction, to the initial or early introduction of a food is very unlikely to be to be severe anaphylaxis. The first reaction is rarely severe yeah. in, and, in infants and toddlers and, and young, very young children. Okay. And typically, you know, what kind of symptoms do we typically see in this age group then? So th this is also an important uh, difference in, uh, that we want to emphasize in infants in particular and, and the youngest of the toddlers is uh, that's why I said that it, you're, you were correct to say or someone would be correct to say that they can't communicate uh, their symptoms, which is true. They do have small airways, which is true. Uh, the, it, infants, anaphylaxis is not as obvious in infants because of that communication for one thing. And Unlike adults, uh, they are very unlikely. Infants and toddlers and young children rarely have hypotension. They get skin cutaneous signs and symptoms. They get airway signs and symptoms, but usually not the hypotension, which is one of the reasons that severe anaphylaxis is less common uh, in, in children. Um, but they have 
other ways of communicating their symptoms that often only the parents really recognize. Uh, so the, the child that is crying inconsolably or is just really fussy and irritable and, and, the, and the parent says, there's this something just not right here. My, my child is just not herself. Uh, I would listen to that. I, I, would, uh, I would sit up and take notice and say something's wrong here uh, that, because the parent is recognizing these uh, subtle behavioral signs and symptoms. And this is reviewed in more detail in the document as to what we mean by that and what to look for. So recognizing anaphylaxis and diagnosing it in children. You know, the, we have no choice but to use the criteria for anaphylaxis that we use in adults because there are no mm. criteria that have been established and validated for infants and toddlers. But we have to recognize that those criteria are really not sufficient for infants and toddlers. We have to be tuned into what's different about young children and be able to recognize that. Yeah, and that that really supports what we've counseled for years in our in our group during oral food challenges. Of mm -hmm. often, we'll walk into a room with an infant or a toddler, and there's an acute change in their demeanor. They were mm -hmm. very happy and playful. We walk in the next time they're sitting on mom or dad's lap. They're curled up. They're they're not feeling well. And that's something that we've counseled parents on over over the last several years as well. So it's nice to see that included here, and it supports our our own experience as well. Yeah, withdrawal. So, you know, what you're describing is also, which I didn't mention, is just withdrawal. They can they can be fussy mm -hmm. and loud, or they can just be quiet and withdrawn. And that's also, uh, again, the parent is going to pick that up and say something's wrong here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh well, let's move on to the third section, and this focuses on anaphylaxis in community settings. Uh, how do you define a community setting for the purpose of this parameter in, in our discussion? Mostly away from home. That's what mm -hmm. we wanted to distinguish, and, and for the most part, that means uh, a school. Uh, other uh, public recreational settings, uh, air and travel settings, um, pretty much anything outside the home uh, and outside of medical settings. Okay. Uh, and this may be somewhat obvious, but I think it's still, it, it would be great to have you explain a little bit further for us. So why is it you know, more challenging to recognize and manage anaphylaxis in the community settings compared to the medical setting? The, uh, incidentally, I, I shouldn't have said away from home. Home is is also community, mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting that in the youngest infants and toddlers, uh, home is the most common setting for anaphylaxis. Whereas in older children and, and teens, uh, it, it, ho out, uh, outside the home is much more likely to be where anaphylaxis occurs than in the home, especially in teens and adults. And 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 uh, in the uh, older children, it'll be uh, sometimes in school, but often in again other community settings. Likewise, in adults, it may be at work, but more often it's other community settings. <clears throat> and what's um, of concern and different about those settings is a, a number of things. The lack of, uh, of on-site medical guidance, the lack of supportive treatment of care and, and care, uh, unpre being unprepared in a sense, uh, often because it's unexpected. Uh, so that's why preparedness is such an important thing at all times. Uh, and sometimes there's a reluctance to diagnose or treat anaphylaxis, uh, it seems sometimes in, in the community setting that it, it just, either it's slower to, to dawn on us what's going on, or there's a, a reluctance of the uh, patient or caregiver to realize or, or accept what's going on. And, and then there's a reluctance to treat it like, oh, uh, which we have heard so many times, oh, I, I wasn't sure, I'll just wait and see if it gets worse, which is of course the worst thing to do. Uh, so there's just many factors when it's uh, outside the home and especially outside of the medical setting that often leads to lack of recognition, lack of treatment, delayed treatment, uh, all the things that can have bad outcomes. Mm. And I know a lot of parents have concerns when they send their young children to child care centers or schools. Uh, and this is specifically addressed in the, in the parameters as well. So what are some steps that they can take to ensure the safety of children as well as adequate management of anaphylaxis in those settings? Uh, it, it's an interesting combination of, of not wanting to overreact or underreact. Uh, again, preparedness is the most important thing uh, as far as recognition and treatment of anaphylaxis. So that involves uh, a training uh, of all the staff uh, and ready access to epinephrine so that it can be promptly administered. And, and in different settings, that will come down to, you know, do you keep it in the uh, nurse's office or in the classroom, uh, and when older kids, when can they carry it themselves? Uh, because delays in administration are, are uh, one of the biggest problems in, uh, in the development of severe anaphylaxis, for example. Uh, 
so it's mainly about training and preparedness uh, and having uh, policies that uh, are both protective but not overly restrictive. That's what I meant by not overreacting. And mm -hmm. uh, we could go into questions about that too. Yeah, well, I think that that's a great one because uh, I know there's a consensus-based statement, number 17 and, uh, specifically, that may uh, you know draw the ire of some folks that don't fully understand what goes into it. So you know, over the last decade, 20 years, we've seen many schools and other public venues uh, put in place peanut bans or nut bans, and they say nut-free schools and things like that uh, because they're trying to protect children with peanut or tree nut allergies. Yet in these parameters, consensus-based statement 17 states that it suggests to not implement site-wide food-specific prohibition. Can you give us some more in-depth in uh, explanation and conversation surrounding that? Now, first of all, that's a grade guideline, incidentally, one of the few hmm. in this practice parameter. Uh, and there are a few grade, grade <clears throat> recommendations, excuse me, um, that derive from a separate document, a, a grade guideline on uh, anaphylaxis in the schools. Uh, the the, the uh, lead author on that uh, was one of the members of our work group, uh, Susan Wasserman, and that's an outstanding document in itself. Uh, and nevertheless, it's a great recommendation, but it's a conditional grade recommendation. So we need to keep that in mind as we were describing earlier uh, in, in interpreting uh, that, that kind of recommendation. But, you know, this, this goes back to, uh, I, first of all, um, I think that kind of... Uh, action within the schools that you were describing the the, the strict uh and that, were, that were and that we're recommending against uh, as far as having site-wide bans and, and strict segregation of, of children who are considered to be at risk um it, that's where i think there's this idea that somehow that doing that um eliminates the need for in my opinion in our opinion for doing the real important things which is training mm -hmm. the staff teaching the children teaching the parents it's it, the when when all of those involved are more knowledgeable and trained this becomes far less important frankly and and partly it was based on you know why was this even put into effect and there was concern in the past that uh about cross contamination but just that uh con just the um inhalation the smell mm -hmm. of a food mm -hmm. would cause a reaction or that somehow just touching a food or, or touching someone else that had touched the food would cause a reaction. So one of the things we emphasize is that those are not impossible, but are very, very uncommon. That almost all reactions to foods occur by ingestion, uh, very rarely by inhalation or by contact. Uh, so that's one less reason to even have these kind of allergen-free tables, for example. Um, and the other aspect is that we recognize is that this is about uh, the ability of the child to self-manage uh, to prevent. This is again where training the staff, training the children, training the parents is what, what is more important. Uh, children who understand and learn uh, the risks of, of sharing uh, or uh, or accepting food that is not uh, known to be safe for them because uh, either their parents approved it or a knowledgeable supervising adult uh, approved it. Um, you know, they, but there's an age, and I can't say a specific age, but this is where the judgment comes in uh, about uh, when are children able to self-manage and, and and have the prevention strategies that they they can sit at the table with their friends and and be okay because uh, they've got all the routines down. They they've learned uh, how to stay safe, and they don't need to be at an allergen-free table. You know, we we come to uh, appreciate and recognize that the social isolation and the feeling mm. different uh, of being at this special table for kids with food allergies uh, can be much more harmful than the chance uh, of a reaction at lunch if other precautions have been put in place. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a great explanation. Again, we'll refer everybody back to the full document. And, and in addition, as you stated yourself and as stated throughout, you know, these aren't 100%, it has to be this way. There are provisions where this may be an acceptable path or other provisions where maybe it is more beneficial to uh, adopt allergen-free tables based upon the needs of the student and so on and so forth. So a lot more in the parameters. Um, but we're going to move on to our next section, which is devoted to a discussion of epinephrine auto-injectors. Can you please explain why this is the preferred treatment for anaphylaxis and when it should be used? Because it works. <laughs> and because it's the only thing that works. 
Uh, and that's important. Uh, you know, we hear all the time that someone took an antihistamine and got better and, and, and that proves that it works. Uh, actually, all it proves is that anaphylaxis usually goes away by itself, uh, except when it doesn't, which sounds silly. But um, it, anaphylaxis, surprisingly, uh, is self-limited. That's a funny statement, but it, it subsides after an hour or two in the great majority of cases. So people are often fooled into thinking something works because they got better. Uh, epinephrine, on the other hand, is the only treatment that works fast enough, number one, Antihistamines take 30 plus minutes often to work. Epinephrine can work in under eight minutes, um, which is not fast enough in our thinking oftentimes, but because eight minutes can be an awful long time when you're waiting for it to work, uh, which I don't miss a chance to say that's why early administration is so important. It doesn't work yeah. instantly. We have to tell patients this. People think they're going to give the injection and in seconds they're going to feel better. They need to understand that it, that it takes five or 10 minutes to work. So if they wait to use it, they're going to have to wait another five or 10 minutes till it starts working. Uh, and that might help them to, to think about using it earlier. Uh, but it's the only thing that works fast enough and it can actually, the way it works, the mechanism of action, uh, is so different from antihistamines or steroids or other treatments uh, in that it can actually stop, uh, abort the mast cell release of mediators like histamine. So it can stop the reaction from progressing and it blocks the actions of those mediators. So it brings back the blood pressure, it, it brings back, it opens the airways, it, it uh, eases all the cutaneous symptoms. It actually works uh, and is the only thing that works against all of the manifestations of anaphylaxis um, so that's why we recommend it and that's why it, sh it should be used and used early. Mm -hmm. Um, by the way, if you are looking for a, a great title for one of your future talks, I think your statement of anaphylaxis is often self-resolved, except for when it isn't. <laughs> it's, it's very attention grabbing. Well, yeah, that, that's a good point for me to mention, uh, cause again, I want to, I want to bust a few myths here that, uh, the, the, the purpose of epinephrine I mean, we think of it as the life-saving treatment, uh, but there's been a, a lot of talk lately about the fact that that's not the reason that we want people to use it. Mm -hmm. Fatal anaphylaxis is, thank goodness, amazingly uncommon. Uh, the, the actual risk of dying from anaphylaxis, when you go into an anaph anaphylactic reaction, what's the chance that you're going to die? 0.1%, uh, one in a thousand. So uh, that's a risk we don't want you to take. Uh, and we want to do everything like we've been saying to reduce and mitigate that risk. But uh, the chance that you're going to die is, thank goodness, actually really, really small. But the purpose of the treatment is to make that reaction get better, faster, so that it's not as potentially dangerous. And, and so that uh, you know, we talk about the morbidity of the reaction. If you've had anaphylaxis, you know you don't want to feel that way again, mm -hmm. uh, even if you're not going to die. You don't want to feel that way again. And uh, and you don't want to have to go to the emergency room, which we'll come back to, or spend the night in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the important reasons to use epinephrine. Well, if we haven't ruffled some feathers yet, uh, just hold on to your seats, everybody. So the next part of our discussion is going to be pretty interesting, and I think we're all going to benefit uh, from your perspective and some additional context here. Um, there's some newer thoughts in regards to anaphylaxis. You've already addressed some of them. There's really a paradigm shift in many ways uh, in, in regards to our, our understanding of it and risk and things like that. And on the surface, these may confuse and maybe even upset some people. But as has been discussed all along, these recommendations are all based upon the evidence. I'm going to read consensus-based statement 23 in its entirety, and then I'll ask you to kind of give us, give us some additional information if that's okay. All right, so consensus-based statement 23, and I quote, we suggest clinicians routinely prescribe epinephrine autoinjectors to patients at higher risk of anaphylaxis. When deciding whether to prescribe epinephrine autoinjectors to lower risk patients, we suggest clinicians engage in a shared decision-making process that considers the patient's risk factors, values, and preferences. So does this mean that we don't necessarily have to prescribe epinephrine to everyone, say, who has a food allergy, for instance? Yes, that is what it means. Um... And food allergy, like and other allergies, insect sting allergy, uh, as another example, um, it covers a broad spectrum of reactions. So food allergy can be an itchy mouth, and for some people, that's all they ever get. Do so they need to have an epinephrine injector? Uh, what's the chance that they're going to one day have a reaction so severe that they'll need it? Well, we have statistics on that, and it turns out to be one or two percent. Uh, now that's not zero. 
And this is, and that's, I could give you other similar scenarios where they're low risk, uh, you know, high risk is 50% chance of having a, a reaction. Low risk is one or 2%, for example. Uh, 0.1% would be even lower risk. Uh, that would be wonderful. But uh, this is all a judgment call. And the question comes up as to whether it's necessary and beneficial to prescribe and carry an epi epinephrine injector when there is a one in a hundred or even one in a thousand chance you're ever going to need it. Uh, not, and, and although cost is an issue, what I really want to mention is that uh, prescribing an epinephrine injector is not a benign prescription. There is a burden, not just uh, economically, but there's a, there's a psychologic burden of that prescription. I sometimes like to say uh, to allergists that uh, prescribing an epinephrine, uh, giving a prescription for epinephrine is a pr giving a prescription for fear. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, and it, in a sense, that's true. And there are actually studies to back that up because that's giving the message that, hey, you might die, so you need this epinephrine injector, which is also why I wanted to emphasize that uh, uh, preventing death is not the main reason that we prescribe epinephrine, even though it certainly is one important way of preventing death from anaphylaxis. Uh, so in the case of low risk, we want to take into account uh, this uh, shared decision-making process. Uh, it takes into account uh, the chances that, that they really will need it on the one hand and the potential harm. So we always look at potential benefits and potential harms of a test or a treatment or a recommendation that we're making to a patient. And what are the potential harms here? Uh, well, uh, a, a prescribing an epinephrine injector uh, has been shown to cause a decrease in quality of life. Um, the, the, the one great study in insect sting anaphylaxis actually showed that, it, because in, in that case, we can actually put people on immunotherapy for vet insect venom uh, and, and protect them. And, and that study showed uh, a dramatic increase in quality of life for obvious reasons, but in patients who were randomized to receive an epinephrine injector instead of venom immunotherapy, after a year, there was actually a decrease in quality of life because for those patients, uh, sure, they were happy they had that epinephrine injector. It's a kind of insurance, if you will, but by the time you need to use your epinephrine, you're already having anaphylaxis. So, and it's a constant reminder that they're at risk for anaphylaxis. So it, it it's reassurance and fear all in one package. And mm -hmm. that's a little tricky. And that's why we need to balance what does it mean to this patient? And that's where it gets really interesting. I ask patients and I talk to my patients, and this is the shared decision-making part of it. Uh, and, and the simple question, if they're at that low risk, is to, of course, describe that risk and explain what are the chances and what could happen uh, and, and maybe bust a myth or two as to whether <laughs> they're going to be whether the next one's going to kill them, because this is what they've heard in the emergency room and from all their friends and relatives, the next one's going to kill you, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, most likely not the case, as I was saying. Uh, but also to ask them, uh, would you feel better and more reassured and be happy to have one? Or does the whole idea make you really uh, uneasy and uh, you don't even want to carry it and you're afraid of it? And do, do you want this thing? And that's where those discussions get very interesting and you'll hear different answers from different people. So uh, this is personalized medicine based on values and preferences and the scientific evidence of knowing what the relative risk is. Um, and you know, there are certainly other factors involved. I could go on about this and I guess I'll urge you to take a look at the document, like how far are they from medical care? Do they have the backup necessary? There's certainly other factors that come into the decision about uh, prescribing epinephrine and when to use it. Right. I mean, nobody is suggesting that, you know, we become cavalier all of a sudden and tell people we don't need that. But this really just, it starts to frame the discussion of we have to have this conversation and we can start to do risk assessments for all these different patients. And just because uh, you have a certain diagnosis doesn't necessarily mean that, that that's the outcome that you're going to have, um, especially if you take into account preparation and communication and everything else. All right, so we're not done yet with some of the controversial statements. So consensus-based statement 24 discusses that prescribing single epinephrine auto-injectors may be suitable for some patients and that twin packs aren't always necessary. Now, this differs tremendously from widespread campaigns. We've all seen them that tell people, always carry two. Um, can you offer some additional context for this recommendation? It's interesting. You know, this is the only country in the world that does not have a, a single unit injector uh, available for purchase. You can only get a two-pack. Uh, 
Hmm. Uh, and and that's thought to be a good thing because of having that backup. And I guess it is a good thing, but it's also restrictive because uh, I have patients who simply can't afford a, a, a two pack. And uh, I've seen patients, unfortunately, who have zero because they couldn't afford to afford two. I'd rather them have one than have none. Hmm. Uh, but uh, is, is it? Uh, I, I, so first of all, I'll point out to the evidence base for what we uh, recommend. Uh, there was a systematic review and meta-analysis that found that 7.7% of anaphylaxis cases of all ages and all causes were treated with more than one dose of epinephrine, 7.7%, uh, including epinephrine administered in the community and or healthcare settings. I'm reading from the document, actually. Hmm. Um, so uh, the, there's been talk in the past that um, that 20% or more of people will need a second dose of epinephrine. Uh, that, that's simply not the case. And again, there are uh, ways of trying to make this judgment with the individual patient. If, if the patient has a history of previously severe anaphylaxis or needing more than one dose of epinephrine in the past, then uh, it's rather obvious that you'd want to have that patient have uh, more than one epinephrine injector on hand. Uh, so when I said 7.7%, that included those patients. Mm -hmm. So now you can reanalyze that and say, well, what about the patients who weren't severe in the past and didn't need more than one dose in the past uh, or that are you know, at low risk, like we were just talking about? Uh, so now all of a sudden, it's probably only 2 or 3% at the most who are uh, going to need a second dose. And now we're back into that low risk range I was just talking about where you have to question the relative harms and relative benefits uh, of doing that, uh, make, making that, well, having that second unit in this case. Mm -hmm. Okay, here comes the big one. Consensus-based statement 26 states that, and I quote, immediate activation of emergency medical services may not be required if the patient experiences prompt, complete, and durable response to treatment with epinephrine, provided that additional epinephrine and medical care are available if needed. So many people have been taught for so long that use of epi automatically means you have to call 911 or go straight to the emergency room. Um, can you clarify and offer some context in regards to this statement? Hmm. That, that, that was a difficult one. You know, it, it was, that was an interesting process. Uh, and maybe I'll describe this a little bit more. Uh, again, the, there's a, a lengthy discussion in the document that is definitely worth reading. Uh, you know, this goes back to the 2020 grade guideline, where we analyzed data regarding how long to be observed in the emergency room uh, after treatment for anaphylaxis. And, it, and we found that beyond one hour of observation, and this is after complete resolution of the symptoms, beyond one hour of observation, uh, and the purpose of that observation, incidentally, is mostly to to capture the patients who are going to have biphasic anaphylaxis, which we didn't really talk much about. Mm -hmm. And that's where you treat it and it gets better. And then two or four or six hours or more later, it comes back and it can come back just as bad or worse as it was initially and require aggressive treatment. Um, and it's a risk factor for, uh, although rare, but a risk factor for fatal anaphylaxis. So uh, ideally, that's why we have had recommendations to observe patients for four to six hours or even up to 12 hours in case they need additional treatment. But in the, uh, in the uh, evidence that we analyzed, we found that beyond one hour of observation, there was a very small incremental benefit in capturing uh, these biphasic reactions. If they're stable for one hour after complete resolution, there was only, we're back into that one or 2% chance that they're going to have a biphasic reaction. And that's a very low risk. And when you look at the cost benefit, the cost of observing someone for uh, six hours or 12 hours in the emergency room, uh, the cost benefit analysis was huge. But safety is, of course, the main concern. Um, so that that's in the 2020 grade guideline where we talked about the observation in the emergency room and the idea that if the patient got better and didn't need more than one dose of epinephrine and wasn't severe, that they didn't need to be observed for more than an hour. Well, then along came COVID, that mm -hmm. very same year that we published that guideline, and people didn't want to go to the emergency department, right? So that mm -hmm. led to uh, some thinking about extending this uh, recommendation into an interim guidance, which was published, uh, that it's not necessary to go to the emergency room if you, you use epinephrine promptly and get 
complete resolution and you get better and stay better, basically, um, then you don't need to activate emergency medical services. You don't need to go to the emergency department. Uh, so now we're into, if we dare call it the post-COVID era, um, and we're looking at extending this uh, co- interim COVID recommendation into a ongoing but conditional recommendation that can be considered by the clinician and the patient and family. Uh, uh, and, and again, the, this idea will come back to shared decision making. That this is not one size fits all. It's, and, and in the guideline, uh, importantly, there's a table that will really help the reader to apply this better. It just goes into more detail about uh, it's kind of you know green light, uh, yellow light, red light. When to when is it okay to just stay at home and not activate EMS? When should you have your finger on the 911 button and uh, but maybe continue to stay at home? And and this often takes into account uh, a lot of the factors I mentioned before. How far are they away from uh, medical services? Do they have backup epinephrine at home? Are they comfortable with this? Have they uh, been known to be adherent or non-adherent to guidance in the past? Uh, and, and there is actually also a table in the guideline about cons- uh, the pros and cons of advising people to not call EMS. So some people are just not the right patients to give that advice to, or, or and some reactions are just not the right reactions to do that in. Uh, so clearly, if the reaction is not completely getting better or it's actually getting worse or new symptoms are developing, then it's time to call uh, EMS. Or if the patient has, even if they're not bad mm-hmm. and they've used epinephrine, but they have a past history of very severe anaphylaxis and needing more than one dose of epinephrine, they should activate EMS immediately, even if they're very mild and they've already used their epinephrine, but they have that background. So th- there are there are a lot of ifs, ands, and buts, if you will, about mm-hmm. this recommendation. but with those considerations, we, we felt that it was the right thing for the right people at the right time to not call EMS. And, and personally, I've had numerous families um, thank me for having that conversation because um, it, it promotes more uh, patient-centered management. And a lot of families have told me, you know, prior to that conversation, they, they didn't want to treat with epinephrine because they didn't want to have to leave wherever they were to go to the emergency room or anything like that. And now they're, they're more likely to treat and observe with confidence. Uh, so for what it's worth, I think with the right family, like you said, it, it can be a big game changer. I'm so glad you mentioned that because yes, we, 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 I think every allergist has heard that. Uh, and I had a patient who was stung by bee in the, when they were camping out in the wilderness and didn't use their epinephrine out in the wilderness because they couldn't get to an emergency room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. this is, it's time to, it's time to change the narrative and change the conversation. Um, and hopefully this document helps with that. Well, um, you know, we're, we're, we've been discussing for a little while now, and there are three more sections. Maybe what I'll have you do, if it's okay, is I'll just sort of introduce the section and have you provide a synopsis of the, the salient points, if that's okay. Um, and the next section really addresses, uh, again, more myth-busting and longstanding beliefs that focuses on use of beta blockers and angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors or ACE inhibitors. Um, uh, tell us the backstory as to why it was uh, previously believed that these were maybe potentially harmful for those experiencing anaphylaxis or at risk for anaphylaxis and what the evidence actually shows. Well, I'll keep the background very short. That uh, It's long been known that beta blockers, uh, because they block some of the effects of epinephrine, they can obviously interfere with both endogenous and exogenous epinephrine uh, having the desired effect in, um, in, in managing anaphylaxis. So being on a beta blocker is considered, a, has been considered a contraindicate. Is, the beta blockers are contraindicated in patients at risk for anaphylaxis and uh, giving anything that might cause anaphylaxis to a person like, let's say, allergy shots, uh, would be contraindicated if the patient is on a beta blocker. The same would apply to ACE inhibitors. Um, but what do we know now? And this is uh, what we know now is based on, uh, again, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis that was just published three years ago, um, two years ago, excuse me, um, showing that uh, these risks are really not nearly as much as what has been previously thought. Uh, And part of this comes down to a concept of relative risk and absolute risk. Uh, And I'll give the example that uh, when we're talking about, so so if if there's a one in a million chance 
of uh, of severe anaphylaxis and that chance is tripled by being on let's say a medication then that sounds terrible that's the relative increase is 300 percent increased risk but it's still only gone from one in a million to three in a million so the absolute risk is still incredibly small so this is where we stand with beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. First of all, it was noted that being on these medications did not increase the chance of having anaphylaxis. Uh, but if the person has anaphylaxis, it increased the chance that it would be severe. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And that, that increase is relatively, it sounds important, if it's a 20 or 50% increase, which uh, it may be in that ballpark, but again, it's going from a very small, if let's say someone is on maintenance immunotherapy and their chance of having anaphylaxis uh, is already very small because they're on maintenance treatment, then uh, if that risk is doubled, it's still a very small risk. So th that's one side of the argument. The other side of the argument is the importance of these medications. The risk of stopping the medication was found to outweigh the risk of continuing the medication. They're on these medications for a reason. Most of this is cardiovascular. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they're on beta blockers for migraine, there may be an alternative that they should consider. But if they're on beta blockers for underlying cardiovascular disease, uh, there's been a, there were some interesting uh, analyses that suggested that the, the risk of stopping or changing those medicines was greater than the risk of continuing them because even though there was an increased chance of severe anaphylaxis, that chance was uh, the, at, the absolute risk, as I was just saying, is actually pretty small, whereas the absolute risk of their cardiovascular disease uh, causing problems if they don't take those medications was much higher. Uh, so that's the argument in a nutshell for saying, and again, this is back to that conditional recommendation with shared decision making that involves the clinician, the prescriber, the patient, uh, as to what the relative and absolute risks are. But it, it, we, we've toned it down a notch so that it's not an absolute contraindication and it allows for continuing these medications along with appropriate treatment like immunotherapy, let's say, uh, when, it's, uh, when both are considered important enough to do so uh, in shared decision-making. The next section in the sixth uh, section in the document uh, really is devoted to an update on mast cell disorders. Um, can you offer some of the, the most important sort of highlights from this section? And again, we'll re refer all of our listeners back to the entire document to, to read all the great information. Yeah, we talked about one of those mast cell disorders, which is uh, hereditary alpha tryptosemia. Um, but mostly we're talking here about um, uh, mast cell mastocytosis. Uh, and which is, we, we should probably think of it as a smoldering neoplasm or malignancy. Mm. It's a clonal mast cell condition. It's a clonal proliferation of mast cells, uh, which can mean that it will be progressive, which, uh, so um, it, it's more clinically important and significant as far as the dangers to the patient. Uh, and because someone who has too many mast cells, uh, which are also activated mast cells, uh, is a, uh, um, I'm, I'm choosing my words because I don't want to make it sound too bad. Ticking time bomb would be one way of putting it, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, but they're, obviously, if they, it, again, they're at greater risk for anaphylaxis overall. So this is different from, for example, I kept saying about beta blockers, race inhibitors, that there's not, not a greater chance of having anaphylaxis. That's not true for mastocytosis. 40% of people with mastocytosis will have anaphylaxis at some point during their lives uh, after that diagnosis. Um, there are other mast cell conditions like mast cell activation syndrome, which are not clonal, uh, but that's where someone, instead of having too many mast cells, may simply have overactive mast cells, if you want to use that kind of uh, analogy. Uh, however, people with mast cell activation syndrome can, can have anaphylaxis, and idiopathic anaphylaxis is actually a subset of mast cell activation syndrome. Uh, but of course, those are patients who have already had one or more episodes of anaphylaxis. Uh, so uh, if someone is diagnosed with a mast cell activation syndrome but has never had anaphylaxis, uh, their risk is somewhere in intermediate, so to speak. But identifying Mast cell conditions is important to know that, uh, to recognize the patients who uh, are at greater risk uh, 
and to uh, advise them accordingly and take whatever measures can be taken to reduce their risk. Even going back to the beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, for example, <laughs> someone with mastocytosis who's on beta blockers or ACE inhibitors, m some greater consideration might have to be given to actually changing those drugs because of this patient who's at great risk for having anaphylaxis due to their underlying diagnosis. Uh, you have just described nuance upon nuance filled with nuance surrounded by nuance throughout this entire conversation. Uh, it, it's great. And I, I love how the conversation really is shifting to just a more thoughtful and I'll approach. I'll just add, you, you made me think of, thank you. <laughs> I'll, 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 you made me, and I'll forget it in two seconds if I don't say this, um, th that uh, the, oh, see, gone already. <laughs> um, uh, that there's this a, clinically, so it's important to note that clinically, uh, there, there are signs that help us to recognize the patients who are more likely to have mastocytosis. Uh, being male and having no hives, so the absence of urticaria, and having hypotension, those three things mm -hmm. constitute uh, some of the main uh, factors in a so-called REMA score. REMA is the Spanish mastocytosis network. And that should raise red flags right away. Someone who's at anaphylaxis and is male, had no hives and had hypotension, uh, should raise red flags immediately that this patient needs to be evaluated for uh, possibly underlying mastocytosis. Okay. Anything else that I, uh, I triggered there while you were thinking of that? <laughs> <laughs> Your, your passion, Dr. Golden, this is why you're one of our favorite guests. Don't tell the other guests I said that. They're all, they're all, they're all our favorite guests. But you, my goodness, your passion <laughs> is just, it's palpable. Uh, okay, so um, one last section uh, deals with what I think many allergists would consider what, one of the scariest scenarios we get consulted on and one of the most challenging scenarios. And uh, this is perioperative anaphylaxis. So an anaphylactic reaction that occurs uh, just prior to the onset of surgery or, you know, during the surgical procedure when they're under cloth and gown and, and you can't really see their skin and things like that. So uh, what, uh, what are some of the major take home points in this last section? Uh, so before, during, or after anaphylaxis, we mm -hmm. should add, because uh, a lot of them do occur in the uh, recovery room. Mm -hmm. um, and that alone uh, raises different questions to the clinician about the possible cause. So the important thing, of course, is to identify the cause. Uh, so that, well, the, the anesthesiologist will be the expert at treating, recognizing and treating that anaphylaxis uh, during and after uh, surgery. Um, but then the question comes up, what about the next time? Uh, sometimes they actually have to abort the surgery because of the reaction, but then the patient still needs surgery. What do they do now? Uh, so it's the evaluation of these patients uh, for future management that becomes so important. Um, the, and there are definitely certain kinds of surgery. This is where reading the document helps uh, it, when you get that kind of consultation because there are certain kinds of surgery that are more likely to cause it. And, and definitely certain drugs. The react, perioperative anaphylaxis is caused mainly by three things, the paralytics, neuromuscular blocking agents, antibiotics, and opioids probably in that order, although it varies from country to country because of the different agents that are used. Uh, but, but pinpointing the cause is not that easy. There are skin tests uh, that can be done. They, uh, other than penicillin, they don't have the uh, full accuracy, uh, but they can be helpful. A positive test can definitely help to zero in on the most likely cause. But we have to recognize that the test, skin testing is not perfect. So uh, as we do with foods, we often have to consider an actual challenge. Uh, obviously, challenging with some things is harder than others. Uh, and that's why some of these challenges, when they need to be done, have to be arranged uh, with an anesthesiologist and often have to be done just before or at the very beginning of the next surgical procedure where the an anesthesiologist can supervise and perform that challenge. And if there's uh, any sign of reaction, move on to an alternative agent. So the, the bottom line with, with uh, perioperative anaphylaxis was that testing is suggested. We recognize that testing is not always possible. Sometimes the reagents are not possible or not all centers do this. So uh, if possible, refer to another center where the testing can be done. But if that's not possible or there's time constraints, then it pretty much comes down to avoiding the most likely culprits and using the most efficacious structurally dissimilar agents.
Okay. Um, this was fantastic. Congratulations again on spearheading a, a thorough and extremely useful update on anaphylaxis. I have zero doubt that this is going to generate a lot of discussion, which is good. I think we need to have these conversations uh, and we need to continue to revisit this and ask questions and, and really dig through the nuance. Uh, what do you hope that clinicians and patients will take into account as they consider if or how to implement these changes? The evidence and the patient. I guess would be the simplest way of putting that is, and which is pretty much what we've been discussing. All of our practice parameters uh, strive to be the most evidence-based uh, guidance that we can provide to clinicians. And in the end, since we often don't have the most conclusive uh, evidence uh, to provide the best recommendations, we have to uh, work this out with the patient. And uh, we want we want what we're doing to be um, safe, effective, uh, and prevent uh, anaphylaxis whenever we can. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, what would you say to somebody who says, you know, I don't care what the evidence says or, or what these parameters say. I'm not changing anything. Anaphylaxis isn't something to mess around with. I understand. And again, the, you know, if, if they were talking about one of our recommendations that is a strong grade recommendation, I would have to sit down with that person and say, let's talk about this because we, we have strong evidence here that, that you maybe want to think carefully about uh, what you've come become so comfortable with about why there may be a, a better way of doing things. But for the most part, that's not where we stand. We have these conditional recommendations. So I have to turn to that clinician and say, I understand. Uh, you've been doing it a certain way. You're comfortable with it. You've, you haven't seen bad outcomes or else you wouldn't be so comfortable with it. And uh, I want you to consider the evidence that we've presented and the options that we've presented and do what is best for you and your patient. Patient mm -hmm. first, and then for you. <laughs> well, Dr. Golden, I, I truly appreciate you taking the time to join us again. Uh, you're always welcome back. Do you have any last words before we depart? It, it's been uh, amazingly educational to, to me as well to do this. Uh, uh, one of the reasons that I love the work of the task force uh, and, and creating these documents is uh, because it's such a, it's a learning process before it becomes a teaching process. And uh, it, it's been great for me and for the entire task force. I, I want to uh, give my thanks to uh, my co-chair, Julie Wang, for this document and to the uh, entire work group and the entire task force, because this is how these practice parameters and guidelines get to be the way they are. Well, thank you again. We hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode. Please visit www.aaai.org for show notes and any pertinent links from today's conversation. If you like the show, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify so you can receive new episodes in the future. Thank you again for listening.